He spoke openly to the world in outdoor settings, like on hillsides, in boats, in gardens. When he saw my squad coming with our clubs and swords to the Kidron Grove, it was he who actually came forward first. He asked who it was we wanted. I scanned around with our lanterns and torches, which brought some much-needed light to the confrontation. I read three words out loud, his name and hometown. Some salty sweat on the brow of the rat who was guiding us in, as he'd been on the lookout for a chance to hand him over to us. Then unexpectedly an awkward kiss in the tensely charged air. I was the commander whose assignment it was to nab him without putting on the thumbscrews. I'd been secretly informed that would be later. Now, it's not just toughness you need in these situations. You need to be as shrewd as a serpent. Now, I know when to use the rear naked chokehold, whispering in their ear if I have to, don't give me the monkey, mate. I've also got a photographic memory as well. I sent it to have in my line of work. You learn to read people by taking mental snapshots. I store them like black and whites in me head. I take pride in me work. It's like hunting. And when I get back to the office after I've bagged one, I like to tell the chief inspector that Bob's your uncle. After I'd said clearly who it was that I was looking for, the man spoke his idea openly as IME. Our law enforcement team, along with some shady religious officials, we were all floored in a unison movement, as if we'd been joined at the hip together. Oh, we couldn't have conspired this if we tried. We just all fell back in a symmetrical motion, Idra headed like a lopsided jangly beast, dancing in reverse, landing with a series of thuds, commotion and clashing swords. Oh, I remember it like a slow-mo replay on the telly. Now, there's been some conjecture that given we came without a warrant, we might have beheld the great mystery for a moment or two, or perhaps bore witness to who we saw and heard as perhaps a form of divine majesty, or maybe a type of potential glory disclosed. Now, either way, I rely on my leadership skills to make logical choices. I've handcuffed just a few rabble-rousers in my time, so you suss out the clues when making arrests. It's all about the behaviour. This one wasn't cocky like others, wasn't angry. No panic, he didn't fidget, he wasn't shifty. Oh, definitely no signs of EDP, emotionally disturbed person. Instead, that look of dignity about him. In fact, he looked you straight in the eye, Fearless, as if he was tethered to something surreal. There was also a noted absence of deceptive manoeuvres I'd seen used by other revolutionary leaders I brought in. No martial arts moves or heroic attempts to flee away. Well, he could have saved his own neck when we all went flat in our behinds. I'm not sure how long it took us all to get up, but I had some other questions ready to interrogate him with. But the arresting one just stood his ground with poise. Instead, it was his sharply focused questions that put us on our toes, like, am I leading a rebellion that you needed your clubs? And then this disarming corker, why not in broad daylight then when I was teaching at the church? When he asked these questions, it was like he could see inside you. His outcast personality was non-reactive, non-threatening and even non-defensive. Well, three nons in my box is highly unusual. He wasn't self-serving either, like those two slippery thieves we'd bound up and brought in the day before. Bizarrely, he said to one of his cronies that if assistance would be needed, 12 legions of angels could be immediately alerted for rescue. Now, I, I know that sounds far-fetched, and this is just my unprofessional opinion. When he said this airy, fairy nonsense, he had this air of authority about him, which seemed upside down to my mind, and given we were the ones with the real authority, you know, the ones with the uniforms and all. Now, I'm a bit embarrassed to say, it was best to not mention anything about the fall down in my report. It could have led to some sticky questions from the chief. I'm not sure I could have explained it to him, as I was having a hard enough time explaining it to myself. So I felt it best to avoid the matter, which overall, would still keep things on the up and up. I did, however, mention that there was an impulsive bloke 
who grabbed a sword like lightning from one of our own team, lashing out maiming a servant of mine. The wound to the side of his head was not pretty, and believe you me, I've seen some roughing up in my time. But I saw a streak of caring in eye me as he picked up and healed Malchus's ear back to wholeness. What well, a blood even disappeared. In the end, we let everyone else go except this man who I handed over. Now, about the rumoured worldly regret over the 30 pence involved in this arrest. I never saw the cheap money exchange hands, but the brash lad said to be concerned for the poor. Well, he obviously blew his reputation by feigning closeness. As you could see, they weren't close at all. It's actually in Hamilcada where the poor sod hung himself. Locals just call it the bloody field. After the arrest, I went home. Oh, I'd been up all night, so I was catching up in me kit. When I was awoken with the earth's tremors mid-afternoon, I opened the shutters to see Friday's appalling black sky. The missus found this so vexing. Well, last year we lost her own son to a crippling illness, and so she's running around the house saying, Oh dear, oh dear, with her hands covering her ears. My neighbour said the local temple had cracked right open, which didn't register on me much, as I'm not a church-going man. And what was this cup some have asked about? Is it like the cup up there on me windowsill? After five years of this particular arrest, I was reviewing some old police files and I came across this quote. I'd somehow missed it. It's one from his former confidante of the deceased, now living on the Isle of Man. It reads as follows. In an obviously protective gesture, the man from Nazareth requested that all his friends be released. I phoned the islander up to verify all this, and I reminded him that we did indeed release all of the companions. But he said I'd missed the main point. It was more about a prior statement made by the man that none of his friends would ever be snatched away, lost, and here's the rub, not forsaken. What? Well, come on. Deserters not forsaken? That's just not on. Look, you can't be a friend and a deserter. It's one or the other. Look, any mutiny in my field gets disciplinary measures, short shrift like, if you take my meaning. By the end of the phone conversation, we were on a first name basis. Johnny said that no one else had accomplished what that man did. But then he gave me a bit of a mouthful and shared that I me was the image of God, the good shepherd, the radiance of God's disclosed glory, the bread of life, the name above all names, a holy, beautiful life given freely for the benefit of everyone, whatever your race. Well, that one rung in me ears. Well, it might sound intriguing to some, but look, in reality, how does one become enabled to take all that in? Well, the follower did humbly admit that his revelation might have gone awry. I'm not surprised in giving the amount of hateful opposition. And of course, everyone now knows about the brutal, sad demise. Now, I've been saying all along that this kind of capital punishment needs to be withdrawn. Plus, mocking just isn't fair when you're outnumbered like that. And there's no excuses for spitting. It's like the number one rule in boxing. You don't hit a man when he's already down. But unfortunately, you know how it is. You can't change the system. Now, one issue I'd like to clarify to remove all doubts. I wasn't present at any of the abusive beatings. Now, about the press. Several have insisted that the man must have handed himself over given he didn't resist and all, whereas I felt like he handed himself over to us by submission, or just like in wrestling, due to the pressure we put on him, he tapped out. Well, what would you say? One writer went so far as to say that he was handed over for the whole world, for examination and evaluation and judgment. Judgment? Well, look, 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 don't get me wrong, I'm not a judgmental person. I just know what I know. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this bit of idealism. The old islander also believed that the man is now alive since his termination. He explained there was a helper with a caring heart who can be our loving security while we fight off the wolves of our past failures and losses. 
Well, I'll mention as an aside, I've got some negatives from a few black and white photos seared into my memory. I actually wouldn't mind some help chucking those out or erasing them all together if that were possible. Oh, so much nattering and gossip about all this. Some of my colleagues have said it's rubbish, especially the clever ones who use uppity words like binary and dualistic. Well, nobody likes black and white, but the wind can blow both ways in these matters. Oh, a constable asked me super quietly by the water cooler the other day if we had all seen the shape of love. No, I am the foggiest, really. I've got to maintain my position of staying in charge in all this. I've tried to get a consensus on the many diverging points of view. Past is past, the chief inspector said to all the staff. Well, past it is, except when it's still acting in the present. And I feel something abnormal happening. I can't forget his eyes looking through me. Now, confidentially, I've taken a leave of absence from work to better assess what was possibly disclosed to me. Now, I have a habit of shelving things, you know, as if that's more convenient. But then your conscience catches up with you one day and all of a sudden your mind has become a bit dull. The missus reminds me to not let my heart get hard or cynical because of what I've seen and heard so much. Well, even if it sounds balmy, what well, can't I hurt, can it? I mean, for me to get a better sense of the great mystery, the unseen becoming real in all, well, even as one of our own poets put it, to get in touch with the transcendent. When I reflect back to the garden that morning, if I'm honest, I think I did detect a sense of majesty in his presence. Yet his clothing was more working class-like than royal. I need to do some more reconciling of what I personally heard and saw that day of all days. Funny, one of me workmates that I used to share overnight shifts with, he and I were talking about the rich smell of the olives that morning and the vivid 3D movie when we all fell backwards together after the power of his name. His three-word answer led to the sound of metal, backsides and elbows all banging and clanging together. The spilling of that burning wax and oil well, ruined a few uniforms. Some of us so overwhelmed, we ended up with our faces planted right in God's earth. A real mosh-up, as the young uns say. There was nothing we could do about it to stop ourselves. My associate says he still has recurring dreams about it. I find I've been dreaming more about my son. And I wish I could be discussing these events with him like the bread we used to share fondly together.